Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Psalms, chapter 107. Psalm 107, verses 1 and 2. And the Bible says, O give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he, whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word and the message this morning. It's a special uh, Sabbath today, you know, honored with the dedication and with Elder Rick Jordan as well. But I'd like to do something. I'd like to ask Michael. You know, last week I had my ordination service, and I was planning to ask Michael to play a song for me. But sometimes when you get very excited, you know, and too much going on, and I forgot to ask him. So I'd like to fix that, you know, and let him give him the opportunity and the chance to play it for us now. So we are very blessed to have uh, Pastor Rick Jordan. He is the Vice President of Potomac Conference and also the Ministerial Director. And it's an honor for us at Culpeper Church that we have that uh, special visit. I think uh, Pastor Rick was working at uh, Woodbridge for 13 years. And uh, I believe your grandson is named Isaac as well. Named Isaac, it's yes. an honor for me, you know, it's a leverage for me, and we're very glad to have Pastor Rick. And can I pray with you? Please, please. Lord, thank you. Thank you for that beautiful Sabbath day. Thank you, we're here. We just pray for Pastor Rick. May you use him and lead him this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Happy Sabbath. It is good to be at the Culpeper Church. Uh, how, Kenny was he mentioned how long have he, was he been a member here 27. 27 years anybody beat that how many okay how many years have you been here 30 some can anyone beat that how many years oh really amen amen well, I have driven by this church many times as I've driven 29 and I have never had the opportunity to come and worship here on Sabbath because I'm always busy someplace, And uh, but it is good to be here. Thank you for uh, letting me come and uh, share God's Word with you today. It was good last Sabbath to to recognize God's calling in the life of your pastor, Pastor Isaac, as he was set aside for ministry to a full-time gospel ministry as an ordained elder in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. It is uh, a privilege to, uh, uh, to be part of that last uh, Sabbath, and thank you for praying for your pastor and praying for this community. Because I recently drove through Orange and just kind of did some exploring with my wife. Orange is changing, isn't it? It is growing and there are lots of people here. And what an influence you have this church right on this main road to serve the Lord. So thank you, I'll be praying for you and, and also pray uh, for me and the ministry that God has called me to. I want to pray before I open God's word. Father in heaven, Lord, I pray that you would open our eyes to see and our ears to hear, not what I have to say, but what you would speak to each heart. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Psalm 107. 
verses 1 and 2. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. For his mercy endureth forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy. If you have been redeemed of the Lord, we're to say so. God is good. His mercy endures forever. You know, I heard somebody say, when I said God is good, I heard somebody say all the time. We oftentimes say that, don't we? God is good all the time and all the time. And that is so true. God is good. God is good when you ha- get that job that you've been working so hard to get. You can say, God is good. When your child is born, we say, God is good. When the child grows up healthy and with all the right parts and all the right places, we say, God is good. When you have recovered from an illness, we say God is good. If you've been in a near miss accident where it seems as if you're driving down the road and an accident you are sure to be involved with, if I don't know if you've ever been in anything like that, but I have, and I've made it through without being involved, I say God is good. See, it is good to recognize God's goodness when he acts in miraculous ways for us. We serve an awesome God who is big enough to take care of every situation that you face and that I face. God is good. But what happens when Things don't go so well. When you and I face challenges and difficulties. When you and I face trials that shake the foundation of our very lives. When we're going along in life thinking, you know, God is good. And then all of a sudden we're brought to our knees because of a tragedy that takes place. Do you say God is good then? Do we always say God is good? I mean, I hope, I hope we, you know, we say that. We hope, and I hope you say that. But today I want to share with you that God is good all the time, regardless of when things don't go well for us. Turn in your Bible with me to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. We're familiar with James chapter 1 because it says, If anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. And God gives wisdom. But just before that, in verses 2 through 4, it is something that we oftentimes just kind of skim over when we go to that Bible promise of asking for wisdom. Chapter 1, verse 2 says, My brethren, count it. Now, if you have it there, what does it say? Count it all what? Joy. When you fall into diverse temptations or various trials. That word temptation here means trials. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh worketh patience, but let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire or complete, wanting nothing. Count it all joy. You count it joy when you fall into various trials and temptations? When these things happen in our lives that are very, very challenging, 
Once in a while, I go to a different translation just to see what it says so that I can get just a different perspective of what this passage says. So in the contemporary English version, verse 2 says this. Whoop, it just changed to a different one here. Here it is right here. My friends, this is what it says. Be glad even if you have a lot of trouble. Do you hear that? Be glad even if you have trouble. You know you learn to endure by having your faith tested. But you must learn to endure everything so you will be completely mature and not lacking in anything. Brothers and sisters, God is big enough to take care of every problem you have. I love the Bible because it reveals to us real life things. These aren't just made up stories. These are real events that took place. And one of my favorite books is the book of Daniel, where Daniel not only is a prophetic book, but it's also a practical book on how to live today. The first part of the book really is talking about faith and how to live a life that is in relationship with God. The other part of the book, a lot of it is dealing with the future and prophecy. But you notice in the stories of Daniel that God is big, that God does the impossible, that Daniel, because of his faith in God, he prays and he gets thrown into a den of lions. And God performs a miracle by closing the mouths of the lions and they do not eat him. The three Hebrew boys who would not bow down and worship the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up on the plain of Dura. They stood up as everyone else knelt down. And the punishment for that was to be thrown into the furnace that was heated seven times hotter, right? It was when those who threw in these young men they died from the heat. But these three men stood in the midst of this fire and they did not even have their clothes burned or their hair singed. And there was a fourth one with them. And that fourth one was who? Jesus. God is big enough to take care of every situation. But I want to be real today. God doesn't always close the mouths of lions. When people are thrown into the fiery furnace, people aren't always miraculously healed or not burned up. In fact, more times than not, the miraculous does not always happen. We pray for God to deliver. But oftentimes, the prayer seems God answers it a different way. Right? We pray for somebody who has cancer. And we pray and we anoint them. But sometimes they die of cancer. A loved one who is uh, going home from uh, visiting family or uh, going home from a church meeting, gets hit head on by a drunk driver. What did they do to deserve that? And are killed. What about the little child who has neuroblastoma? What did the child do to deserve that? Now, there are some times that we, you know, the, the things happen to us in which we kind of brought on ourselves. 
There are some things that we do. You know, if, if uh, uh, you know, a marriage breaks up, not always is it your fault, but if somebody is having an affair and your marriage breaks up, you can't blame someone else. The blame is, is on you, right? Or what if you lose your job because you choose not to show up for work and just say, eh, it's not important or I don't take my job seriously, or I slack off, whatever, and you get laid off. Is it your fault or is it God's fault? But see, here's the thing is oftentimes when people face difficult things, we want to blame somebody. We want to say, well, who, why God? Why didn't you change the situation? Why didn't you... Why did I lose my job? Why did this happen to my loved one? Why am I sick? You could change it. Now, I'm sure probably no one here ever blames God for anything, but that is human nature. We want to blame somebody. We want to put the blame on somebody. And so we think, you know, some people may think, God, why Aren't you hearing my prayer? Why is my loved one going through this? And you're not, you know, and here's the thing is God is big enough to take anything that we give him. You know, but God wants us to come to him and, you know, sometimes our lack of faith, God God understands our lack of faith and we blame. But, Not always are we quick to say God is good when things really rock us to the very core. Sometimes we simplify our faith so much and water it down so much that it is not a a good testimony to God. For example, all you have to do is believe. All you have to do is pray, and God will take care of everything. Sometimes we hear children's stories where, where, uh, you know, something happens, and all you have to do is pray, and God will take care of it. Sometimes God is big enough to do that. But God doesn't always answer our prayers the way we ask him to answer them. Why does God save one person and not another? Now we can, you know, uh, try to give some explanation about sin in the world and how the devil is a roaring lion and things like that. But here's the thing. I don't know always, I don't know the answer always, and neither do you. Because we don't always understand the whole picture. We don't know. In the Sermon on the Mount, the very last parable found in in Matthew 7 of the Sermon on the Mount is about two men who build identical houses. Both houses are, are built, the only difference is the foundation in which they're built. One is built on sand, and the other is built on what? A rock. Now, both of these, and these, of course, represent the believer, the Christian, the follower of God, and the unbeliever and the foolish, the wise and the foolish. Again, the only difference between these two houses is the foundation. Both of them experience rain. Both of them experience the wind and the fury of the wind just whipping around them. And both experience a flood. The storms of life come to both Christian and non-Christian, to believers and unbelievers. We all face these things in life. The only difference is the foundation 
of your faith? Is it built on Jesus? Or is it built on something else? Three years ago, we could say three years ago to, um, to this very day, I was the healthiest I had ever been in my life. Because unfortunately, seven years ago, I didn't, I, don't, I didn't look like I look now. Seven years ago, I weighed over 300 pounds. And all of my adult life, I've been overweight, up, way up into the over two, 280, 290, 300, 320. Three years ago, I was 320, or not three years ago, seven years ago, I was 320 pounds. Had a high, you know, you can be a vegetarian and be overweight. Some of us are called carbitarians instead of just vegetarians. Because you like bread and pasta and those put on the pounds. They can anyway. I had a resting heart rate of over 90 beats a minute. Somewhere almost around 100 beats a minute. One time I tried to give blood. And when I went to give blood, we had a church blood drive. And the, um, the person who was going to take my blood checked me and said, your heart rate's too high and your blood pressure is too high. You cannot give blood. I was disappointed. But um, seven years ago, I changed uh, diet, you know, watched what I ate, uh, cut out uh, many of the carbs and the, uh, the calories and the eating late at night after getting home from a board meeting or Bible studies and changed my eating habits and started exercising. And, and before, I couldn't even walk up a hill without being out of breath. And uh, I don't know if any of you have ever been to Camp Blue Ridge, but down at the cafeteria, where the cafeteria used to be, walking up to the town hall, I couldn't even walk up that without breathing hard. But I started running and started, uh, you know, doing exercises. And so I, I lost over 130 pounds. And praise God, I've been able to, you know, maintain uh, a very healthy, active lifestyle. Here's the thing is that three years ago, healthiest I'd ever been in my life, my resting heart rate is in the upper 30s no longer in almost 100 now it's in the upper 30s and i don't have i don't have uh, um, high blood pressure i'm on no medication you know praise god for that but 3 years ago i never thought i would hear the word cancer but i remember it distinctly april 1 2018 it was a Sunday. I decided to go for a run. I ran 13.1 miles. That's a half marathon. Just wanted to go out. It wasn't running a race. I just wanted to run a half marathon. You know, and, and the next day I felt a little sick. Didn't feel very well. And by, uh, you know, Tuesday I started getting uh, uh, fever and, and sweating and chills and and uh, I finally went to the doctor. I just felt miserable. And the doctor said that I had a urinary tract infection. And so after giving me some antibiotics, the doctor said, you know, you need to see a specialist. You need to see a urologist because men usually don't get urinary tract infections. We can, but there's usually a cause for it. And you just need to go get checked. So I went to a urologist. He sent me off to get an, a, a, a um, uh, ultrasound of my bladder and my kidney, or both kidneys. And as the uh, guy doing the ultrasound checked my bladder and then my right kidney went to my left kidney and he spent a lot of time on my left kidney. And he said, oh, I'm sorry, did that hurt? 
I'm like, no, it didn't hurt. And he just spent a lot of time measuring and going over my left kidney. And then at the end, he said, I need to go get uh, the doctor of radiology. And that never happens, you know. Uh, But he came in and he started looking at my left side. And uh, after examining it with the ultrasound, he said, I'm sorry to inform you that you have a large mass on your left kidney. It's okay. You know, I didn't feel it. I mean, it wasn't anything I felt externally, you know, or anything. It wasn't bothering me. So I went home and I looked up on the internet. Internet's a great thing, but it's also a scary thing. <laughs> and so I typed in large mass on kidney. And it said, uh, you know, gave a variety of things, but, uh, you know, could be a cyst, could be a tumor, could be cancerous. Uh, So uh, the urologist got the results and sent me for an ultrasound. And it was decided that I needed to have my left kidney removed along with the large mass that was attached to my kidney. They thought it was cancerous. But the only way you can tell with kidney cancer is if it's removed and then there's a biopsy of the, of the um, tumor. So I'm scheduled for surgery. I remember the day very well. And I, they were going to do this laparoscopic procedure. And that is six small holes in my abdomen. And they were going to put these instruments in there. And then everything, the doctor was using the latest technology, using a computer. So the computer was actually following the directions that the doctor was putting in there and uh, moving these little instruments inside of my body, June 6th, 2018. And as the doctor was cutting around the tumor, he did not realize at the time that there was a blood vessel that was dedicated strictly to this tumor that was feeding the tumor. And the doctor cut it. And I started to bleed out. And so this very precise laparoscopic surgery quickly changed to being a life-saving surgery. All of the equipment was removed. They coded me. Everybody came running into the operating room. They gave me uh, units of blood. And then I'll, I'll move here so you can see. They cut me from here to here in order to get the blood stopped. And they did. After surgery was completed, the, uh, they went out and they told my wife that I had given birth to a seven pound, it turned out to be stage three cancerous tumor. Seven pounds, that's the size of a baby. And I didn't even know it was inside of me. It had pressed down. I mean, the way it was in my body is it was like almost in my pelvic area. And because I went running, it, it somehow displaced my bladder and then caused an infection. And then I found out about it. I wouldn't have known if I didn't have that infection. 
afterwards, somebody uh, um, said, wow, you know, you really went through a lot. And I said, God is good. God is good. But here's, you know, I, the only treatment I need, I needed was to have that cancerous tumor removed. I didn't have to have chemo. I didn't have to have radiation. I didn't have to have any, anything else. But what I have to do is every year I have to go back and get you know, an ultrasound and follow up. And they, they always do a chest x-ray. Why do they do a chest x-ray? Because kidney cancer can come back and it rarely ever goes to the other kidney. It goes to the lungs or to the bones or to some other part of the body. So again, the internet's a great thing, but I, you know, probably a year ago, I, I typed in reoccurrence of kidney cancer. You know, you typed in something like that, and it said uh, over a five-year period. And right now, I'm at the about the two and a half year mark. You know, so I'm about halfway through. But between you know a five over a five-year period, somebody who has had kidney cancer. The chance of reoccurring is between 20 and 40 percent. You know, 20 percent, well, that's pretty good. 40 percent, that's almost a flip of the coin. You know, almost. It could be either way. Today, I praise God, I am cancer free. I have no, you know, there's no issue. But what does the future hold? I don't know. But here's what I do know is God is good. God's goodness is not contingent upon him answering my prayer the way I want him to. Or if that he heals in a way that is miraculous, or that he saves in a miraculous way. God is good all the time. I shared this, my testimony um, at a church um, last year before COVID. And um, somebody came up to me afterwards and said, my loved one, I think it was a sister, died while on the operating table. Kind of something similar take, take place. I don't know why I was saved and someone isn't. I don't, I mean, I, I, I wish I could give you that theological answer, but I don't know. I don't, you know, God has a big work for you to do is our standard line that we say. Or that God is not finished with you yet. Yeah, you know. But I don't know. But this is what I know. If I wake up today or tomorrow, it is a gift of God. I don't earn being alive. It is not, we're not saved by being vegan. You are not owed one more day. Because any one of us can go out and something happen. We can be hit by a drunk driver. We can get in an accident. We can fall asleep because we're tired. You could end up with cancer. We don't know what the future holds. If I wake up today, it's a gift. From the little child who was born yesterday, if that child wakes up, it's a gift. If the 90-year-old woman, grandmother, wakes up, it's a gift. It is not that I am owed anything. It is that today, if I am given this chance, I'm going to serve God with all my heart. Because he is good, regardless of what happens, regardless of the difficulty you and I face, the challenges that may come your way, that may rock your life to the very core. God is good. Oftentimes, when we face difficulties, we pray for deliverance, 
don't we? I mean, isn't that the natural thing for us to do? And rightly so. We pray, God, take this away from me. Remove this situation. Restore this. Or change the situation so that your mighty hand will lead in this. We pray for deliverance. And God is big enough to take care of everything. But again, in ways that I don't understand, and I don't think I have to understand. So God doesn't always answer the prayer the way I want him to. And that things may end up being terrible, and that I am not delivered. Think of all of the apostles in the New Testament, how many of them died a natural death according to tradition? Anybody know? One. And who was that? John. Everyone else died martyrs. So I want you to remember Psalm 46. If you don't have this underlined, you need to have this memorized, and many of you probably already do. Psalm 46, verses 1 through 3. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof, though the world is crumbling and your very life is being shaken and your life is like it's being uprooted and thrown into the sea, the storm of life that comes. God is our refuge and our strength. The one who helps us in these difficult times. God is the one that we turn to and we put our trust in him. Regardless of what happens. Regardless of tomorrow and the tragedy that I personally may experience, the uncertainty of life. God is my strength. He is that refuge that I turn to. And he sees me through. So maybe instead of just praying for deliverance, we pray for, listen, endurance. Because endurance is that no matter what happens, no matter what I face, God I know is with me. And he gives me that strength to help me endure that which I can't endure myself. Jesus prayed for you know, when he taught his disciples how to pray, you know, he said, deliver us from evil. When Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed, if this is possible, may this cup pass from me. He prayed for deliverance. And while Jesus was on the cross, the Father, it seemed even to Jesus that the Father that he was all alone. But he was able to endure, even because in the Garden of Gethsemane, it tells us that angels came and ministered to him. The Apostle Paul, this man of faith, this godly man who used to be a persecutor of Christians, was this man who went around preaching the gospel to thousands of people. 
Gentiles. We have much of the New Testament, his letters that were written. There is no one probably more influential in the spiritual development of the early church than Paul through the Holy Spirit. Paul was arrested for a crime he did not commit. He was put on trial and he was found guilty. And he was sentenced to death. He knew the form of uh, death that would come his way, and that would be beheading because he was a Roman citizen. He would not be crucified like other uh, people who were condemned to death. What did Paul do to deserve death? Nothing. He was faithful. God didn't deliver him. I mean, wouldn't that have been a miracle? You know, there right as, as he was getting ready to be executed, that, that somehow the axe couldn't come. I mean, it would have been an awesome miracle. But that didn't happen. Paul faced his end, at least in this life, in a very violent way. The very last book that he wrote or letter that he wrote is Second Timothy, and it was written just a few months before his execution. He knew he, he had been on trial. He had been found guilty. He knew what the sentence was, and as he wrote this last letter to Timothy, he was just awaiting the execution to take place, and so he knew that his time was up. So this is what he wrote to Timothy in chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning with verse 6. For I am now ready. Listen to the words that Paul says. We, we've read this before, but understand the context. He is waiting for the execution. He knows his sentence. For I am now ready to be offered as an offering. And the time of my departure is at hand. He knows he's about to die. I have fought the good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. How often we've quoted that. I fought the good fight, but this was at the very end. He knew just any time he would be executed. And listen also to, to verse 16, Paul saying this, at my first answer or when he was at his defense, no one stood with me, but all men forsook me. So Paul is there, this man of God who influenced hundreds of thousands of people in his lifetime. When he is there before the judge at his defense, no one stood with him. Everyone else had abandoned him. And he said, may it not be laid to their charge. Verse 17, notwithstanding, the Lord stood, stood with me. So he's saying that while everyone else was there, I was all alone, but I was not all alone. The Lord stood with me and strengthened me that by me the preaching might be fully known and that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. <laughs> He's using the very image of Daniel in the lion's den, that he was delivered 
from the mouth of the lion. Now, wait a minute. How, how could he be delivered from the mouth of the lion when in just a few short months he would be executed? He wasn't talking about this life. Talking about the life, eternal life, that's more important than this life even. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Paul would be put to death, but God was with him. God gave him strength. So no matter what you and I face, no matter if we're delivered or not, when we put our trust in him, in the Lord, God stands with us. He gives us strength to endure when you're heartbroken, when you are in filled with pain, when something tragic happens and you don't understand why, and you even ask God, why God? We may not be able to see, but we know that God will give you the strength to endure whatever it is that you face and that I face. Going back to that translation of uh, James chapter 1, the um, contemporary English, it says, My friends, be glad even if you have a lot of trouble. You know you learn to endure by having your faith tested. But you must learn to endure everything so you will be completely mature and not lacking anything. When your faith and my faith is tested, and we put our trust in the Lord, our faith matures, and we learn to rely and to trust in Him. May it be, Instead of just praying for deliverance, and we do pray for deliverance when there's difficulty. More than just pray for endurance or pray for deliverance, pray for endurance. Give me strength. Lord, whatever comes my way, whatever happens tomorrow, whatever happens later today, whatever happens in 2021, Lord. Give me strength. Be with me. Help me carry on. You cannot, and you, you've heard this probably many times, you cannot have testimony without the word test in it. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, you know what each of us face. You know the struggles that we have. You know everything about us, and you know the future. Lord, I pray that you would give us trust and faith that we will just have such a connection with you that we will just trust you because you are good all the time. And we want to praise you and thank you. Give us strength. And may you help us endure. And we wait for that deliverance. And it may come when Jesus comes again. May that day be soon. In the name of Jesus, amen. Thank you. It's very powerful.